Good evening, class. We're so glad to have you. And uh, just like to say hello to some of our classmates that are not able to be with us here in person tonight because they are not feeling well. We hope you feel better very, very soon. No matter where you are watching, from near or far, we welcome you into our classroom tonight. We are studying the book of Romans and we're working our way through it. We are in the 11th chapter of Romans and we are heading toward the end of the book of Romans. And so if you're joining us, I would love to hear if you'll just either call and leave a message for me and tell me where you're watching. You know, I, uh, we would love to know from wherever you are watching, whether you're in Canton, Ohio, or you're in Canton, China, wherever you're watching, we'd like to hear from you. So we are in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. And um, we are at the 25th verse. And um, it's kind of interesting because this verse um, starts with brethren, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant. And it's kind of interesting, and I, I, I heard this on Sunday, and I just uh, kind of went, just went, uh, and um, a well known pastor's wife, or the wife of a well-known pastor. I guess I, I guess I would say that, um, maybe I would use the term quite loosely. But she's done a video. And it's kind of interesting because I was listening to a radio program just this week, a local radio. Well, it was on a station that's local, but the program was not. And it, but, but it was a teaching that was done by somebody who's already went home to be with the Lord, but said very sim something very similar. That preacher made this statement, and the statement was this. Jesus had no authority until he was baptized. Hang with me. And I'm listening to this, and, and I, sometimes I talk back to the TV, and sometimes I talk back to the radio, and I went, no, that's heresy. Okay. And so I thought that was bad enough. So then I'm sitting, and we're watching a, a, a program, and where the pastor of this church was sharing that a staff person had shown her this video done by this pastor's wife. And this is what she said. She said, Jesus was just a human being. He was just a man until he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him. And uh, I, I have to, I, I was sitting with someone and I, I will embarrass her tonight. But she turned to me, she said, well, what about the virgin birth? I said, that's right. But I said, and I said, that's, that's right. But do you know what just shoots that all to pieces? Philippians chapter 2. Please hear me. It is, Jesus was always, as he walked this earth, 100% deity and 100% man. He was always eternally the second person of the Godhead. Always. And by the way, that woman happens to be married to the guy that does this with his eyelashes. So some of you can point the dots at that. But I will say this. The only time you'll ever see a Bible there, you'll never see it open. The only time you'll be a Bible is when it's held up. Now why do I say that? Brethren and sister, I would not have you in here. I've always said, check me out. Now, I will tell you that if I, sometimes I can talk too fast. 
what do I mean by that? My mouth goes faster than my brain sometimes, and I might say the wrong thing. I remember listening to a pastor one time talking, and they were talking about Noah, and they were saying Moses the whole time, and I know it was just a mix-up, which is why, but why I always say what? Check me out, and check me out with the Word of God. Listen, I don't care what I say. Make sure you have your Bible, and you check it out. I have no problem with that. I want you to. But everything you hear needs to be checked out by this word. Has to be. So I would say to you who are near, you who are far, and you who are sitting in front of me tonight, go to the word of God and make certain that what you are hearing is the word of God. Because what Philippians says isn't that he didn't have his deity, it said he, he set aside, laid aside, didn't give it up, he laid aside the expression of his deity. But guess what? After the resurrection, the ascension, guess what he did? He took it back up. So be very careful because, you know, people sometimes, they just, have you ever been in a place and somebody has said something and it is absolutely false and everybody goes, <laughs> thinking, why? Listen, check it out. Now, one more thing, and then we're going on because it has to do with this. Because Paul was, was writing to people he loved and cared about and he wanted to see them grow spiritually. And he said, I want you to be ignorant. I remember years ago, it's been decades now, my mother and I went to a, con a convention, a women's convention. And a woman uh, was speaking, and she used as her text, according to the work of my hands, command ye me. So we're sitting there, and, and you would have to know my mama, some of you knew my mother. And so we're sitting there, and so she, she teaches for 50 minutes using that scripture, only it was taken out of context. And she was telling every woman there how they could command God to do whatever they needed done. And, and my mother looked at me, and I looked at her, and we both said at the same time, scripture out of context is error. Now let me tell you about that scripture. Some of you took Hebrew, some of you took Greek with me, and you know that context is very important. But actually, the way that should be read that has to do with the, the way that it is said and, and how it is formed in the Hebrew it should be read like this. Uh, it's because it is a question, not a statement. I mean, you know, there's a difference when it's a question and a statement. So it's an interrogative. Oh. And what the Lord is saying in that scripture is, according to the work of my hands, command you me. And he goes on, where were you? Da, 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 da. That's how it should be read. So, brethren, sisters, I would not have you be ignorant. Everything I say, everything I teach, please feel free to check it out and say, well, I don't understand that because we need. Now here, Paul is very, very serious because he wants them to know something. He said, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. And the mystery he's talking about is God's plan for his natural people and God's plan to bring the Gentiles in. And I will tell you this, there are many people today across the world who are ignorant of God's plan for his natural people and for the Gentiles lest you should be wise in your own opinion. How many know anybody that's probably wise in their own opinion? 
I don't want to be wise in my own opinion. I want to be wise in God's word. That blindness in part. How many know what part means? In part. It means not in what? Entirety or whole. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And I'm just going to tell you this. The fullness of the Gentiles does not mean when the last Gentile has gotten saved. Okay, so ignorant is agnoiai. Agnoiai. Uh, does anyone see a word that there with there with which you're familiar that kind of looks like that? How many have ever heard of the term agnostic? And an agnostic is someone who says we can't know whether there was a if there's a God or not. And I, 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 I agree with that because in this sense. Yeah, because you can't know that there's a God if you are ignorant. Okay. But we are not ignorant of that. We can know that there is a God, and guess what? It goes beyond that. We can know him. But this word, it's present tense, so it means it's speaking of being continuously ignorant. And I will just simply say there are some people in the world today who are continuously ignorant or uninformed. U-N-I-N-F-O-R-M-E-D. They're, they're just, they just don't know what's going on. Now, some people are ignorant of the truth, and I'll just be honest with you, because truth has not been taught to them. You know, there are people that, that today think, oh, well, God was just finished with Israel, and so therefore, uh, nothing's, they're not God's people anymore. Uh, he's just cast them aside, and now the church has replaced Israel. How many of that's ignorance? Because that's not what the word teaches. That's not what, I don't care whether you go uh, to the Old Testament or the New Testament, but you put it all together, and I will tell you that is not the message that is there. Others are uninformed because the teaching and preaching in their houses of worship is shallow. S-H-A-L-L-O-W, shallow, S-H-A-L-L-O-W. And I'm sorry, but if this is not preached, what's being said is shallow. Um, and I think enough time has passed that I can safely say what I'm going to say. So I, I, I've made a statement to people, and I said this, soundbite Christianity will not get you through the tough times. Now, what do I mean? That little one I say. And um, I've seen a great deal of shallowness float across the body of Christ. And like I said, I think enough decades have passed. That there was there was a, a man who was um, I don't know how to describe him. I guess maybe this missionary. I guess. But he used to have this little soundbite saying, and it was. Christians should own the banks, not owe the banks. And uh, we had a, uh, an assistant pastor here during that time, and no one could mock him the way he, this assistant pastor could. He said, you know, I'm getting so sick of that phrase, own the banks, rather than owe the banks. I said, oh, you have got him down pat. Well. To, to make a long story short, that guy crashed and burned. And he had a beautiful wife who continued and, and probably did more with the ministry after that than, than he had done up to that time. But sound by Christianity, it's not enough. If you are not firmly grounded 
in the promises of God. How can you stand on the promises? See, you've got to know what this word says because once you know what this word says, you can say, I know this is my promise. I'm going to reach in to this word and I'm going to hang my whole being on God's promise to me because I know his promises are sure. But if all you have are little cute sayings, and no foundation in the word of God, I will tell you that's shallow. And that's why a great many people don't know truth. And they're ignorant and they're uninformed because they don't know this. Or there is a tendency to, here's a good one. How many have heard this statement float across the body of Christ? We have to be seeker-friendly. Oh, yes, we want to be seeker-friendly. Um, well, there's this there a tendency then to avoid non-seeker-friendly topics. And I will tell you that, that non-seeker-friendly topics are in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Because how many know there's some real strong doctrine in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And so I agree. I, I have my youngest member of class just agreed with me just now. She's just, a, she's just, just a sweet little baby, and she agrees. You know, the most friendly topics uh, are usually the ones that don't even call for a commitment, right? But as I read the word of God, there came a time that you had to make a decision. Whether it was in Acts 2, whether it was a time when Jesus confronted people and said, take up your cross and follow me. And they said, from that moment on, people didn't follow him. Well, they came for the loaves and fishes But there comes a time when you've got to decide what you're going to do. Are you going to follow him? Because you can't stand around on the periphery forever. So the Apostle Paul says it in Ephesians. He said, having done all, take a stand and then stand there. You've got to do that. So the most despicable reason for ignorance is not that one has not heard the truth. But having heard the revelation of this mystery, and it's God's, that mystery we're talking about is God's plan for Israel, and God's plan in allowing Israel to be blinded and set aside for a time that the Gentiles might be brought in, but having heard the revelation of this mystery makes a conscious choice. They decide to choose to reject it. And that is even, that's either to reject it on part is Israel, part of Israel, or to reject it on the part of the Gentiles who think that they're, boy, they have just replaced it. They're now God's special people. Any questions about ignorance? Um, so, in respect to this rejecting God's plan and not understanding and being ignorant of it, there exists, and we can't deny it, there exists a subtle anti-Semitism. Now, I want to stop here because some people go to seed on this. Oh, well, anti-Semitism means more than uh, just uh, Jewish Israel, being anti-Jewish or anti-Israel. Because uh, there are all these different Semitic races. Here's what I would say to that. Culturally, but yes, I agree. There are many races that were descended from Shem 
or Sam, same Hebrew letter. I understand that. But you tell me what other member of the Semitic people group has ever been hated, slaughtered for who they were. I don't know of any other Semitic race that that, that happened to simply because of who they were. That's number one. Number two, culturally, when we speak of Semitic, immediately everybody thinks of what? It's okay to say Jewish, Jewish people, Jews, or Israel. Okay? So culturally, so when I say a subtle anti-Semitism, I, I don't think there's a person sitting in front of me or listening wherever you're listening from that don't know exactly what we're talking about. And I will say that that anti-Semitism occurs in much of the church world today. And what I mean by that is some believers do not like the fact, they don't like the fact that God has a chosen nation, and that there's, there's the operative word, a chosen nation called Israel, I-S-R-A-E-L. And they don't like the idea that God is not finished with them. F-I-N-I-S-H-E-D. He's not, fin by the way, God is not finished with Israel. He is not finished with Israel. He, he still has a plan for Israel. And I was just sharing with uh, the class before we went live tonight that anti-Semitism, and I'm not even talking about in all over the world, I'm talking about right here in the United States of America. Anti-Semitism has gone up, and this is what is just astounding, has gone up 388% since October 7th, 2023. If you don't know what happened on October 7th, 2023, I don't know where you were, but that was the slaughter. And when I say slaughter, I mean absolute slaughter of 1,200 Israelis and over several hundred, over 200 who were taken hostage. Over 100 are still held hostage tonight. Why would it go up that high in the United States after they were slaughtered? And the, and the thing is they're, they're blaming Israel. It's, it's craziness, and I'm gonna tell you, it's craziness hatched in the pit of hell by the devil. It's the devil's business to do this. He's the one behind it, the enemy is behind it. And unfortunately, it is an absolute disgrace, but anti-Semitism is found in some churches. Now, Paul is saying, he said, I want about this mystery. He said, I, I don't want you to be ignorant about this mystery. And that word in the Greek is mysterion. And I've given you the Strong's number there, 3466, because this is not a mystery like whodunit mystery. This word mystery in the New Testament speaks of some truth. So it's a truth that is not discoverable apart from being revealed by God. In other words, it's a truth, but it needs to be revealed to us by God. And it's the same thing if you, if you took uh, Old Testament research with me. Remember we went through the book of Daniel. And so you see that mystery word in Daniel as well, but basically what he was saying was a mystery now, but God's going to unveil it and reveal it to you. So mystery then in the New Testament is a truth previously unknown, but now is revealed. So why is Paul saying this, that I would not have you ignorant? 
about this mystery because it's been revealed. So the mystery, and by the way, it's supposed to be the mystery. That was a typo. And that was on my fault. That was not something that the computer did. Sometimes it does it, but I more than likely did that one. The mystery revealed here is that Israel's hardening is partial, is partial. See, there are people that are teaching what? That it was permanent and that was it. God just cast them off. No, that is not true. It's partial, not complete. And not only was it partial, but not complete, but it's also temporary. It wasn't permanent. It was temporary. And it was temporary so that God could fulfill his plan to bring in legitimate Gentiles and people who didn't know who they are and see themselves as Gentiles, and maybe they are and maybe they aren't. But it was God's plan. <clears throat> and so Paul, was concerned that some Gentile believers would be wise in their own estimation. Ooh, you know, you know this deal. Look at us, we are so great, and God cast them off, and look at us in, because we're so great. And, I, I, and I'm sorry to say that, but I've been places where I've seen that kind of conceit among people who call themselves Christians, who say the church has replaced Israel, and God has no need for Israel anymore, and all the prom, prom and really, I've actually been in, in situations where they've said, all oh, the promises that God gave to Israel are not ours. Well, in the sense that by faith, you've been grafted in as the seed of Abraham by faith, but not at the exclusion of Israel. Because he said, you're going to get conceited. And there is, there is, believe me, anybody ever been around conceited people? I'm not even going to say what I could say tonight. I'm not going to say it, but I am so sick of hearing all the conceited people. You know, I have a real problem with narcissists. Just leave that and run right up past it. Just have an honest estimation of yourself. You know what an honest estimation of yourself is? By the grace of God, I am what I am. Do you know the great, probably one of the greatest scholars in the world? The Apostle Paul. And by the way, he's the one that penned those words. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Now God chose him. God used him. And I'm just going to say there was not another person that probably could have done a better job in penning most of the New Testament and the doctrines to pull the Old Testament together with the New and just explain it to us other than the Apostle Paul. God, God knew what he was doing. So Paul wanted them to understand that God's sovereign plan to put Israel aside temporarily. And it's like I've said to you, it's like uh, giving Israel a temporary timeout and said, while you're in timeout, I'm, I'm basically going to deal with these people over here. You know, sometimes when you teach, you kind of put a student in timeout or a few students in timeout so that you can kind of work with some other students without distraction, right? But it doesn't mean forever. I mean, you don't go home at night and leave them over there in timeout, right? And so for a while, he put them aside in order to show, and here's the reason, grace to the Gentiles. He said, to sh and because it is designed to display further the glory of God. Okay? And that shouldn't be there. It just says that he put Israel aside temporarily in order to show grace to the Gentiles, which was designed in, to display further the glory of God. 
And it's sad that some of the church world has not realized that that was part of God's plan. Beautiful design. Any questions, comments about that? Anybody have comments? Now God had always, how many know what always means? Always, all the time, had a Jewish remnant. R-E-M-N-A-N-T. So he'd always had a Jewish remnant. And I will just say this. He is definitely saving Jews in our day. Right now. There are Jews coming to salvation right now. And so, in essence, right now, Paul is returning to the subject, really, with him, which he began the 11th chapter of Romans. Has God cast away his people? And Paul answered what? Certainly not. And then he used himself as an example. He said, for I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So guess what? He's saying, I'm a Yehudite. So if God had permanently cast off his people forever, he said, I wouldn't be here. He desires to explain to his readers, and his readers were the Romans and, and also then us, right? But the Roman church was made up of both Jews and Gentiles, but primarily Gentiles. Primar primarily, obviously, who? Romans. But there were some Jewish people, and uh, as well as, and by the way, uh, within the Roman church, uh, there were members of Caesar's household, people in Caesar's household, who were believers, and it just so happened that Paul's brother married the adopted daughter of Caesar. Uh, which explains something. Remember when Paul said, I appeal to Caesar? Uh, now, how many know that each one of us as American citizens have the right to have a case taken to the United States Supreme Court? Technically, according to the, that's our right. But how many know that you have about this much chance of having a case of yours sent to the Supreme Court? Well, the same thing was true there. You know, you had, the, you had the legal right to appeal to Caesar, but unless you had some kind of an in, you had about that much chance of having Caesar hear your case. But when your brother is married to Caesar's daughter, you know, you kind of have a little bit of an in there. And that, that I've just given you, that's just history. So he is wanting to explain to his readers how God would work out his plan for his people whom he had not rejected. God has, has put, him kind of, put him in a kind of a timeout, but he has not rejected them. He has not rejected them. So what we <coughs> want to see here, because he said, well, this partial hardening, <coughs> and again, it's partial, <coughs> but it's going to be fully lifted when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And I'm going to tell you what that is not. I've told you what it, you know, it's, I'm going to tell you what it's not. That is not when the last, I, 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 just, I just recently heard someone say that too. Well, when the last Gentile person is saved, no, 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 no. And we're going to look at it. It says, well, it, it's partially hardened until, and it's, but it's going to be fully lifted. How many know what fully lifted means? Fully, completely when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So we need to look at this term 
that says blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, we have to look at this word fullness. And in the Greek, that is pleroma. And I've given you the Strong's uh, number there, so if you have a Strong's dictionary, you can look that up. This word describes fullness, a full measure. <coughs> an abundance, a completion, a completion. So the completion, and we need to look at this word, Gentiles. Now, in Hebrew, that word is goyim. You want to make it out to the side. And if you have a Hebrew translation of Romans 11.25, this, the, that word that says Gentiles will be goyim, G-O-Y-I-M. In Greek, it is ethno. And again, I'm giving you that Strong's number. And it means peoples or people groups, nations, nations. The blank there is nations. And there's a reason why I'm giving you that. Tribes and tribes, uh, just post it, note these two words, nations, tribes, and of course, Gentiles. Now, I want us to go to Genesis 48, 19. This is, and I know some of you already know this because we looked at this in a different sense when we were tracing, some of you were here when we traced the tribes. In Genesis 48, 19, and I'm just gonna tell you, it's where J Jacob, Israel, uh, is blessing Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so <clears throat> I want to pick up at 17 because what is happening, you can see what happens. He's blessing, and normally the oldest son would get the birthright, okay, the birthright blessing. So Jacob Israel is asking. Uh, Joseph to bring his sons. And basically what he's going to do here is uh, we know that Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. And he, the whole story, you know, sold into slavery by his brothers and rises to prominence in Egypt and then the whole family comes down. So he, by the way, Jacob had other sons. He had Reuben, who was the oldest, and then he had Simeon and Levi. And, and we know that uh, Reuben uh, did some things which caused him to lose the, the right to being the firstborn and having the birthright. So then it would have then it would have passed to Simeon, and then, and then to Levi. Well, Simeon and Levi. Uh, they were just cruel and vicious, and they lost it. So then it falls, very interestingly, the next in line would have been Judah. And hang with me, just kind of put, put brackets around Judah because, yes, that was a part of it. But what happens now that you're going to see, the birthright is going to bifurcate and what happens is Judah gets the right of rulership and government, and we have the, the scepter. But the good stuff, the material uh, blessings are going to go, would have gone to Joseph, okay, because of the favorite son. But now, instead of that, what is going to happen is that 
Jacob Israel is now going to adopt Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, as his own. And the two of them are going to actually become two tribes among the children of Israel, which children of Jacob Israel. So now he's going to bless them. So what happened is Manasseh was the oldest. So Joseph brings his sons before his father for the blessing, which is going to be basically a birthright blessing as he adopts them as his own. And what, and this is, this is, this is what I want you to see. He does this. And that angered Joseph. So let's look at verse 17. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. And if you have a Bible like mine, it's in italics, which means it was added by the translator. So he's basically saying, uh, uh, I know my son, I know he all, okay. Go, for, this, for this, the firstborn. In other words, he's, he's trying to take the hand and say, this, this one, firstborn. And, uh, but his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. In other words, this wasn't an accident, I did it on purpose. He also shall become a people. And some of you already know who that people primarily is, or some people who are primarily a part of that people, singular. And he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he. Now, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Now, I have written out for you on your notes to kind of help you understand this. Uh, And when we see Vizarro, Ia, Melo, Hagoyi. Now, I want you to obviously uh, focus on the Melo, Hagoyi. Uh, his descendants shall become, shall become. And we know that's called imperfect. So uh, whatever time they're keeping, and by the way, they're continuing to become a multitude of, now here's the key, nations. So it is said of uh, Ephraim. It says Manasseh will be a great people. And if you will hear when we did the tracing of the tribe, how many would say they are a great people? Uh, not doing so great, but the people are, are wanting, you know, some of us who are a part of that, you know. And for you at home that missed that, um, I think they're on there. They are, they're ar archived somewhere, and you can see that, and you can go and follow and find out and read about the tribe of uh, Manasseh. And you might be very surprised who the tribe of Manasseh is. A part of, by the way, the part of, a part of the tribe of Manasseh resides in that location. But he said, but Ephraim, shall become a multitude of nations. Now, how many are seeing the fullness of nations? So, uh, 
So if you're looking, and I've given you that it is Genesis 48:19 is pletho. If now the Septuagint. Now what is the Septuagint? You can tell me the Septuagint. It is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That becomes very important because if we're going to if we're going to compare. Now I gave you the Hebrew. So you're seeing it saying basically the same thing in Hebrew, but now I want us to actually look at the Greek and compare it to Greek. How many know it's going to be clear when you're comparing Greek to Greek? So the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So I want us to look at Genesis 48:19, and I know that was it's kind of blurry, so that's why I've written it out to you um, so that you can see this. So this is plethos ethno. Now that's the very same passage we just read in Hebrew. It is in Greek. How many are seeing a similarity between what you and I read in the Greek New Testament with the Greek translation of Genesis 48, 19. They're the same words. Whether it's plethora or plethos, ethno. So what is it saying? Fullness of the nations. Fullness of the Gentiles. But it should read fullness, fullness of the nations. And so what is happening here? Well, these verses give us insight from the promise given to Ephraim that continued through the northern kingdom of Israel. And I note this, that often in the Old Testament, the people of the northern kingdom of Israel with their capital at Samaria that we're talking about. Well, after the kingdom split, you had the 10 northern tribes with their capital of Samaria, the kingdom of Israel, not the united, the divided kingdom, northern kingdom of Israel. Then you had the southern kingdom of Judah with its capital of Jerusalem. That often the people of the northern kingdom of Israel were often referred to by Ephraim. Now, what do I mean? If you read the prophets, if you read the minor prophets that were that whose messages were directed primarily to the northern of king, kingdom of Israel, many times the prophet would say, "The word of the Lord came to Ephraim." Now, it wasn't just referring to Ephraim; it was return, referring to all the northern tribes. But because Ephraim was the prominent tribe, and isn't that what? was promised, right? When, when, when Jacob blessed Ephraim, understand something, that blessing carried through and it was a prominent, the prominent tribe. And so they were often referred to by Ephraim because the descendants of Ephraim comprised the most prominent tribe in the northern kingdom. And actually sometimes, believe it or not, how many have ever read some of the prophetic books in the Old Testament will say, and the word of the Lord would say to Joseph. Well, because Ephraim and Manasseh were the children of Joseph. And so sometimes God will say Joseph, and, and what he's meaning is obviously Ephraim, sometimes Manasseh's primarily. Any question there? So the tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel went into captivity in 722 B.C. after they were conquered by Assyria. And from the places into which they were placed, and they were, uh, and we looked at these, obviously Assyria took them, put them east of, uh, actually toward the east, in uh, Habor, it actually, and you know where it was, so you have your maps and see where they were along there. But they didn't stay there, right? And eventually they started migrating, and they migrated east, and they migrated north, some migrated south, and many of them migrated west, and they continued to migrate. 
they continue to migrate, and they continue to migrate. And they were scattered across the world. And when they were scattered across the world, they lost their identity. They lost their identity. And they lost their language, L-A-N-G-U-A-G-E. -E. And even the full, full memory of their fate. There were little things, obviously, that they did, and they kind of did because they had always done them. You know, there are certain things we do, maybe because our parents or your parents did it, or because our grandparents did it, but sometimes we don't know why we do it. We, we, I mean, in other words, we don't know what was behind that, and that's what they were doing. They had little things. And remember when we traced the tribes, we thought there were certain people groups that do certain things. Uh, for example, one, uh, for, particular nation, uh, they still, they, they refer to their day of worship as Sabbath, but they don't know, I mean, they just do. And, and um, they, even though they're worshiping on Sunday, they call it Sabbath. And if you ask them why, they don't know. There was a whole people group that said, we don't, we don't eat pig. We don't eat pork. But they don't know why they don't. It just what? It was passed down. So that's why I'm saying they lost the full memory of their faith. So God, God had told them that he, uh, that should, there should be a wood there, that he would, sc would scatter them. He told them he would do that. And this is what God told them. In their scattering, they became the fullness of nations. Most particularly, those descendants of the tribe of Ephraim. E-P-H-R-A-I-M which gave rise to the nations of the United Kingdom. Now, if you know anything about Manasseh, I'm going to take a little sidebar, because I know some of you may be tuning in for the first time tonight, and you're probably a little lost because you don't have the background of the tracing of the tribes. Remember when Joseph brought his sons to be blessed. What Jacob said to him about his son Ephraim, he said he would become a great people, or nation, but Manasseh, but Ephraim would become nation. How many know that the one thing that even our leaders in the United States of America have always said is we have never been in the business of what? Nation building. In other words, we're not trying to go in somewhere and take it over and build a new nation on top of it. I mean, that, I, I remember that. I, I remember, for one thing, I remember Secretary of State Colin Powell saying, that we're not in the business of nation building. But we are a nation, and we have impacted the world. But what do, you, what do we know about the United Kingdom? They are nations, plural. Whether it is Australia, New Zealand, uh, Jamaica. Uh, um, South Africa, oh, I'm not even going to go there. India. India. I mean, if you understand, nations. And remember what I said about the tribes as they have spread east, north, south, and west, become uh, nations. 
So, however, representatives of each of the tribes have gone throughout the whole earth. And we know that. Now, according, according to the prophecy which Jacob, Israel, declared about Joseph in Genesis 49, 22, and you can either turn there or I will just read it to you. He said, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. And basically, you know, I think about a well, anything that uh, is growing toward a well yet is very fruitful. Why? Because its roots go down in the water and then and the drilling will flourish. But here's, here's what I want you to see. His branches run over the wall. Run over. Um, some say his branches have climbed over the wall. How many know that's basically what has happened? You know, they've gone over and over and over and over, and they're everywhere. And we really can say this about the tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And they, by the way, they are. They are. So... According to that, his descendants would spill over like a branch over a wall. And by the way, once that branch goes over the wall, it still bears fruit on the other side of the wall. So it is probable that they indeed became the fullness of the nations that Paul speaks about. Now, So I, I, uh, time is, I know that about one minute. So I, I want us to go back. You're, you may be there, so I'm going to go back to Romans 11. Um, so it basically says that blindness, in part, has happened until the fullness of the nations, um, of the Gentiles, has come in. So I want us to think about this for, for a moment. We know that something is happening in our day and has been happening for a little, little while now. And that is uh, for example, I would just simply say, 40 years ago, uh, how many of your parents had a DNA printout? That's what I thought. And I'm looking out across everybody in class and not one hand went up. Of course they did. Now, we had stories. I had stories that were told to me. And. Um, in, in, in one case, well, it was quite obvious because um, by the last name of my maternal grandfather, I, I, it was pretty clear. It, uh, there was ethnicity there. But, I mean, as far as actually having a DNA printout, and when I got my DNA printout, please hear what I'm going to say. It was so detailed that it said, you have a grandparent who was born between 1890 and 1910, who was 100% Irish. And when I saw that, I thought, that's right. My grandfather was born in 1899. That's pretty close. They had a 20-year window. So that what I'm saying is they didn't have that, so they didn't know. Well, then I heard stories both from my father and uh, my mother said something that a great aunt had told her, but they were just they were just things that they were told. And so 
then I got DNA. And the stories basically had proof. So why I'm saying this is that there are many people all over the world who do not yet know, maybe they haven't, they don't have any clue, but who does know? God knows where they are. So according to this, he said, um, blindness is in part has happened until the fullness of the nations comes in. What we are seeing, a couple things, the fullness of the nations is the people are going to start doing what? Realizing who they are. That's all. Now, as people start realizing who they are, something else is going to happen. What, what else is going to happen simultaneously? Well, it says, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles starts to come in. The fullness of the Gentiles will start to come in. Oh, oh, oh. So simultaneously, what's happening? Do you understand what's happening? There are people who are of Israeli descent who are starting to, who have maybe practiced Judaism, who are starting to take a new look. Right now in Israel, there is a whole group of rabbis who are not Messianic. They're rabbis, and they are, have sent, made this statement. They're coming together to re-examine the Old Testament scriptures and the life of Christ. And they are saying, we need to take a new look at Yeshua of Nazareth. Now, why? Because people are beginning to do what? The nations are going to begin to be gathered in. At the, and simultaneously, there was that. There, there is happening. Oh, and Jewish people are coming to the knowledge of Messiah. And there are some really exciting things happening. And I, I, I shared this once before, but it kind of excites me every time I hear, hear this. And it's happening in different sec, uh, segments of the world. But there was a girl who. Basically, it was just searching for the Lord. And, and, and it, it, was, it re, kind of reminded me of what happened to Batya Siegel. And some of you know Batya because we met Barry and Batya when we were uh, volunteering at Vision for Israel. But she has a marvelous, she was just walking, she was walking home from work by the Western Wall. And, and, and um, she had gone to work at a place where just happened to have a messianic believer working with her and started sharing with her about the Messiah. She's on her way home from work. She's walking past the Western Wall and somebody started walking along with her. And she hadn't seen that person before. And it was the Lord who appeared to her. Now, if you know anything about Barry and Bacha, what they've done for the Lord and what they're doing in the nation of Israel. And she said, you know, from that moment, I just knew that I knew that I knew. I just knew and I never looked back. I never questioned. I just knew he was the Messiah. God has always had a remnant, but God will, God will do the impossible by our standards. That's not possible for him. And these are the kind of things. And I heard about a, another girl. She said, she was sharing with somebody. She said, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they said, well, how do you know that? She Because he appeared to me. And he talked to me. And they said, well, how did you know it was Jesus? She said, you know, I just knew. I just knew in him. When he started talking to me, I just knew that's who it was. I believe that. This now, why I'm telling you this is, you see what's happening in this at the same time that 
Israel, descendants of Israel who never knew who they were. Listen, our parents, grandparents may not have known who they were, but now all of a sudden we're beginning to see hints here and there and what's happening at the same time. That's happening. The fullness of the nations is coming in. Guess what? The blindness, little by little by little. We know that ultimately that blindness will be lifted when? At the second coming of Jesus. And by the way, when he comes back the second time, and we will be coming back with him, because we will be coming back with our Lord and Savior, and they're going to see him, and they're going to recognize the same person who's our Lord and Savior as their Messiah. There won't be any doubt. I don't know about you, but I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that day, and I think it's a whole lot closer than even we realize. See, don't let anyone tell you that God's finished with Israel. Don't let anyone tell you he's finished with you, because he's not. God's plan is going to come to fruition because he declared it. He is working his plan, and God's plan always comes to a completion. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you with all of our hearts. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And Lord, we just give ourselves over afresh and anew to you. Use us for your honor and glory. I pray that you would give us on a daily, continual basis, Holy Spirit, guidance. Lord, use us in any way you see fit. And we pray for everyone watching tonight through the video, where, wherever they are, whether they're local, whether they're halfway across the world. We pray that you would give them that hope and let them know that you have a future for them and you have a plan and you will bring to completion the plan that you have for their lives. And we give you the honor and the glory that is due you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be looking to see you back here next week and know that we love you and Jesus loves you so very much. And God, your heavenly Father, has a plan for you. <laughs>